Hello and welcome to Let's Talk Criterion, keeping you posted on what's coming in physical releases from the Criterion Collection. And we've now topped 200 subscribers on the channel, so thank you to everyone who subscribed and their support and comments. Now, sad news has just reached me before recording the video that Melvin Van Peebles passed away at the age of 89. Now, I featured his new box set of four films coming out in the US on Criterion, due out on Tuesday, September 28th. He was a great exponent of black consciousness in film, and his major achievements being Sweet Sweet Back's Badass Song and Watermelon Man. Criterion 4K News. This will be a regular feature going forward. We've the announcement with the US December releases of Michael Powell and Emmerich Pressburger's The Red Shoes, coming to 4K on Tuesday 14th of December, retailing at $39.95. Now that looks like the price Criterion are setting for 4K releases. We are now just waiting for The Piano and A Hard Day's Night to have their release dates announced, and I would expect more titles to follow in 2022, and we'll likely get more 4K announcements by the end of this year. Now, there's been a lot of speculation on chat forums about Sounds of the Lambs getting a 4K Criterion release. Now, I think that's highly unlikely now, as Kino Lorber have announced their 4K release of this title later this year. So what do we have in October? Well, we start with Onibaba, a title already in the collection on DVD, but reissuing on Blu-ray, and this is great news for collectors. Deep in the windswept marshes of war-torn medieval Japan, an impoverished older woman and her daughter-in-law murder lost samurai and sell their belongings for the most meagre of sustenance. When a bedraggled neighbour returns from battle, lust, jealousy and rage threaten to destroy the trio's tenuous existence before an ominous ill-gotten demon mask seals their horrifying fate. Kaneto Shindo's chilling foretale Onibaba conjures a nightmarish vision of humankind's deepest desires and impulses. Now, Onibaba was inspired by the Shin Buddhist's parable of Yome Odoshi no Men, Bride Scaring Mask, or Niku Zuki no Men, Mask with Flesh Attached, in which a mother used a mask to scare her daughter from going to the temple. She was punished by the mask sticking to her face, and when she begged to be allowed to remove it, she was able to take it off, but it took the flesh of her face with it. Horrifying. Kaneto Shindo wanted to film Onibaba in a field of shishiki grass, so he sent out his assistant directors to find suitable locations. Once the location was found near a river bank at Inba Swamp in Chiba Prefecture, they put up prefabricated buildings to live in. Filming started on June 30th, 1964, and continued for three months. Shindo built things such as a makeshift turtle water slide to entertain the crew and keep things cool during harsh conditions of filming out in the fields of really nowhere. The crew members were doing laundry and living in the fabricated buildings during the filming process, and the crew members grouping and eating together things like onigiri and soba noodles was caught on camera as well. Now they had a rule that if somebody left they wouldn't get any pay, to keep the crew motivated to continue. Onibaba was released in Japan on November 21st 1964, where it was distributed by Toho. The film was released in the United States by Toho International with English subtitles on February 4th, 1965. The score was composed by Shindo's long-term collaborator Hikaru Hayashi, and the background and title music consists of taiko drumming combined with jazz. The main cast consists of Nobuko Otoa as the older woman, Yitsuko Yoshimura as the younger woman, Kai Sato as Hachi, Tanji Tonoyama as Ushi, and Yujichi Ono as the Mask Warrior. The features on the disc include an audio commentary from 2001 featuring director Kaneto Shido and actors Kai Sato and Jisuko Yoshimura on the Blu-ray only, interview from 2003 with Shindo, on location footage shot by Sato, there's a trailer, a stills gallery featuring production sketches and promotional art on the DVD only, and a written essay by the film critic Elena Latsik, and that's a 2001 director's statement by Shindo and a version of the Buddhist fable that inspired the film on the Blu-ray only. The Blu-ray cover illustration, incidentally, is by Edward Kinsella. 
Onibaba's already in the collection and is released on Blu-ray on Tuesday the 5th of October as spine number 226 in the US only. And incidentally we also have Onibaba on release in the UK from Masters of Cinema, should you not wish to import this title. Now out on Tuesday, October the 12th in the US, is a classic High Sierra with Humphrey Bogart and Ida Lupino. Now this is a very welcome addition to the collection, marking the moment when the gritty gangster sagas of the 1930s began giving way to the romantic fatalism of 40s film noir. High Sierra also contains the star-making performance of Humphrey Bogart, who alongside top build actress Ida Lupino proved his leading man metal with his tough yet tender turn as Roy Earl. A career criminal plagued by his chequered past, Roy longs for a simpler life, but after getting sprung on parole he falls in with a band of thieves for one last heist in the Sierra Nevada. Directed with characteristic punch by Ral Walsh, who makes the most of his vertiginous mountain location, this gripping thriller sends Roy and Lupino's Marie, a fellow outcast also desperate to escape her past, hurtling inexorably towards an unforgettable cliffside climax and a rendezvous with destiny. Now the screenplay for this film was co-written by John Huston, Bogart's friend and drinking partner, and was adapted from the novel by William R. Burnett. The film cemented a strong personal and professional connection between Bogart and Houston and provided the breakthrough in Bogart's career, transforming him from supporting player to a leading man. The film's success also led to a breakthrough for Houston as well, providing him with the clout he needed to make the transition from screenwriter to director, which he made later that year with his brilliant adaptation of The Maltese Falcon 1941, starring Bogart of course. George Raff was originally intended to play Roy Earl, but he rejected the role as well indeed as Paul Mooney from Scarface. It was adapted as a radio play from two broadcasts of the Screen Guild Theatre, first on January 4th 1942 with Humphrey Bogart and Claire Trevor, and the second on April 17th 1944 with Bogart and Ida Lupino from the film itself. The film was remade twice as the Western Colorado Territory in 1949, starring Joel McRae and Virginia Mayo, which was also directed by Raoul Walsh, and again in 1955 in I Died a Thousand Times, starring Jack Palance and Shelley Winters, directed by Stuart Heisler, but the original still remains the definitive version. Now the features on this disc are Colorado Territory, the 1949 Western remake of High Sierra by Raoul Walsh, yes it's the entire film. New conversation on Walsh between film programmer Dave Kerr and critic Baron Smith Namey. The True Adventures of Ral Walsh, a 2019 documentary by Marilyn Ann Moss. Curtains for Roy Earl, a 2003 featurette on the making of High Sierra. Bogart, Here's Looking at You Kid, a 1997 documentary aired on ITV Southbank Show. New interview with film and media historian Miriam J. Petty about the actor Willie Best. New video essay featuring excerpts from a 1976 American Film Institute interview with novelist and screenwriter W.R. Burnett, a radio adaptation of High Sierra from 1944, the one I mentioned earlier, and a written essay by critic Imogen Sarah Smith. High Sierra is released on Tuesday, 12th of October, as Spine 1099. Next up, we move to the UK with the release of La Dolce Vita, the Federico Fellini 60s classic on Blu-ray. Now again, this has been available in the US collection for some time on Blu-ray, but the single release will allow fans of this director to enjoy this beautiful film. This is of course part of the essential Fellini collection available in the US. La Dolce Vita, Italian for The Sweet Life or The Good Life, is a 1960 comedy drama directed and co-written by Fellini. The film follows Marcello Rubini, played by Marcello Mastroianni, a journalist writing for gossip magazines over seven days and nights on his journey through the sweet life of Roma in a fruitless search for love and happiness. The screenplay co-written by Fellini and three other screenwriters can be divided into a prologue, seven major episodes interrupted by intermezzo and an epilogue. La Dolce Vita won the Palme d'Or at the 1960 Cannes Film Festival and the Oscar for Best Costume. 
It was nominated for three more Academy Awards, including the Best Director for Federico Fellini, and the film was a worldwide box office and critical success, and is now frequently regarded as one of the greatest films in world cinema. Most of the film was shot at the Cinecitta Studios in Rome. Set designer Piero Gagliardi created over 80 locations, including the Via Veneto, the Dome of St Peter's, and the staircase leading up to it, and various nightclubs. However, other sequences were shot on location, such as the sequence The Party at the Aristocrats' Castle, filmed in the real Bassano di Sutri, the palace north of Rome. Some of the servants, waiters and guests were played by real aristocrats. Bellini combined constructed sets with location shots depending on script requirements. A real location often gave birth to the modified scene and consequently the newly constructed set. Fellini scrapped a major sequence that he was planning that would have involved the relationship of Marcello with Dolores, an older writer living in a tower, to be played by the 1930s Academy Award winning actress Louise Rayner. Now the features on this disc are a new interview with filmmaker Lena Wertmuller, an assistant director on the film, new interview with scholar David Forgangs about the period in Italian history when the film was actually made. New interview with Italian journalist Antonello Sarno. Interview with director Federico Fellini from 1965. Audio interview with the actor Marcello Mastroianni from the early 1960s, Felliniana, a presentation of the Dolce Vita Ephemera from the collection of Don Young. A new visual essay by the filmmaker Cogonada. And an essay by critic Gary Giddens. Now this picture was an incisive commentary on the deepening decadence of contemporary Europe and it provided a prescient glimpse of just how gossip and fame obsessed our society would become. La Dolce Vita will be released in the UK on Monday the 18th of October at Spine 733 and if you want to get into the work of Federico Fellini this is certainly a great place to start but I would also recommend in the collection Eight and a Half, Juliet of the Spirits, Knights of Cabrera and Roma, to name but a few. The Incredible Shrinking Man is a 1957 American sci-fi film directed by Jack Arnold, based on the Richard Matheson 1956 novel The Shrinking Man. The film stars Grant Williams as Scott and Randy Stewart as Scott's wife Louise. While relaxing on the boat, Scott is enveloped by a strange fog. Months later he discovers that he appears to be shrinking, and by the time he's reached the height of a small boy, his condition becomes known to the public. When he learns there's no cure for his condition, he lashes out at his wife, and as Scott shrinks to the point where he can fit into a doll's house comfortably, he has a battle with his family cat, which leaves him lost and alone in his basement, where he is now smaller than the average insect. This was a popular favourite with audiences in the 50s, and both delighted and frightened theatre goers alike. Before the film's release in New York City on February 22, 1957, its ending went first to test audiences, who felt the character's fate should be changed, but the director stuck with the original ending and it remained in the film. The Incredible Shrinking Man opened in New York on February 22, and this was followed by a screening in LA on March 27, and a wider release in April of 57. By the end of the year it had grossed $1.43 million, making it one of the highest grossing science fiction films of the decade. Special effects shots were done using black velvet trick photography and it took three weeks of post-production and they were scheduled after the film completed production on July 13, 1956. Warren described the special effects as hard to assign correctly. Clifford Stein, whose field was process work and rear screen projection, is credited with the special photography, and the boat scene at the beginning of the movie was shot on Universal's process stage, which allowed for rear screen projection. Shots of Scott in certain scenes, such as his encounter with the mist, were shot with him against a black velvet backdrop. There were no CGI effects back then, so visual effects were much harder to achieve, either being done in camera or using rear projection, or actually superimposed on the film stock itself. A laborious task. Matheson scripted a sequel to The Incredible Shrinking Man titled The Fantastic Little Girl, but it was never produced. The Incredible Shrinking Man set a bar, which was followed by many 60s sci-fi films. Now the extras on this disc are very generous. 
a new audio commentary featuring genre film historian Tom Weaver and horror music expert David Schechter. A new programme on the film's special effects by effects experts Craig Barron and Ben Burt. A new conversation between filmmaker Joe Dante and comedian and writer Dana Gould, auteur on the campus, Jack Arnold at Universal, Director's Cut 2021. Interview from 2016 with Richard Christian Matheson, novelist and screenwriter Richard Matheson's son. Interview from 1983 with director Jack Arnold. An 8mm home cinema version from 1969. The Lost Music of the Incredible Shrinking Man. A trailer and teaser narrated by Orson Welles. And a written essay by critic Geoffrey O'Brien. The Incredible Shrinking Man is released on Criterion Blu-ray on Tuesday 19th of October in the US only as Spine 1100. In her breathtaking and assured debut feature, Lynn Ramsey creates a haunting evocation of troubled Glasgow, set during Scotland's national garbage strike in the mid-1970s. Rat Catcher is set in Glasgow, 1973. The city, despite its Victorian grandeur, has some schemes with the poorest housing conditions in Western Europe, such as no running hot water, no bathing facilities and no indoor toilets. The city is midway through a major redevelopment programme, demolishing these schemes and rehousing the tenants in new modern estates. Well, the problems in these schemes are somewhat compounded by the bin men going on strike, creating an additional health hazard and a breeding ground for rats. The main character, James, is a 12-year-old boy who is growing up in one of these schemes and is gradually emptying as the rehoused tenants move out. James, with the rest of his family, two sisters, one older, one younger, his mother and heavy drinking father, patiently wait to be rehoused. Now this title has long been awaited on Blu-ray as it's been available in the collection on DVD only for some time now. Lynn Ramsey is a Scottish director whose hometown is Glasgow. Ramsey studied photography at the Napier College, Edinburgh, and in 1995 she graduated from the National Film and Television School in Beaconsfield, where she specialised in cinematography and direction. She is now renowned for her later features, including Morvin Seller from 2002 with Samantha Morton, and of course We Need to Talk to Kevin, which was hailed at the 2011 Cannes Film Festival, but more recently You Were Never Really Here enjoyed great critical praise with Joaquin Phoenix in the lead role. Ratcatcher is the first of her full-length features in a relatively sparse filmography so far, but with this quality her career got off to a great start. Young actors are the centre focus of the story, with Tommy Flanagan as George Gillespie, Mandy Matthews as Anne Gillespie, Michelle Stewart as Ellen Gillespie, Lynn Ramsey Jr. as Anne Marie Gillespie, Leanne Mullen as Margaret Anne, and Thomas McTaggart as Ryan Quinn. Now it's true to say that the film features the fictional Gillespie family, certainly, but the central focus of the story is the superb performance given by William Eady as James Gillespie. He gives an excellent performance, portraying the innocence and awkwardness of an adolescence in a cruel urban environment. I thoroughly recommend you take a look at this film from a raw filmmaker just starting out and establishing her style. Now the features on the disc are on the DVD only, there's a digital transfer, which is enhanced for 16x9 televisions. Slightly outdated now, I know. A new interview with Ramsey from 2021 on Blu-ray only. An audio interview from 2020 with Kutschler on Blu-ray only. Three award-winning shorts by Ramsey. Small Deaths from 95, Kill the Day from 96, and Gasman from 97. Interview with Ramsey from 2002, Stills Gallery DVD only trailer on the Blu-ray only, and written essays by film critic Girish Shambu and filmmaker Barry Jenkins, which are on the Blu-ray only. Ratcatcher is released on Blu-ray by Criterion in the US only on Tuesday 19th of October and it's spine number 162. Now I mentioned now for two releases out in the UK on Monday 25th of October, and that's Gina Price Blythewood's Love and Basketball and Lucino Visconti's The Damned. Now I covered both of these in the last edition of Let's Talk Criterion, and the link to watch that video is on the screen now. 
So finally, we look at DV. Now, this is a film by Sanjit Ray. He has other films already in the collection, namely The Excellent The Music Room, Charilata, The Hero and The Home and The World, and of course, the Apu trilogy. DV is based on a short story by Pravat Kumar Mukhopadhyay. Now, the title means goddess. In rural India in the second half of the 19th century, after his son, Sumitra Chatterjee, leaves for Kolkata to complete his studies, a wealthy feudal landlord, Chabi Biswas, is seized by the notion that his beloved daughter-in-law, a hauntingly sad-eyed Sharmila Tagora, is an incarnation of the mother goddess, a delusion that proves devastating to the young woman and those around her. The elegantly stylized compositions and the chiaroscuro lighting by cinematographer Sobrata Mitra heighten the expressionistic intensity of this domestic tragedy, making for an experience that is both sublime and shattering. Now, the film stars Sharmila Tagore as Daya Moji, and Chabi Biswas plays Kalin Kar Chaudhry. Sumitra Chatterjee plays Oma Prasad, and Parnodo Mukherjee plays Tara Prasad. Ray's films have often focused on religious dogma and the conflict this causes to its central protagonists. Now, unfortunately, the extras on DV are quite sparse and they include only a new programme featuring interviews with actors Sharmila Tagore and Sumitra Chatterjee recorded in 2013. There's a new video essay by the film scholar Meheli Sen, new English subtitle translation of the film and a written essay by film critic Devika Jirish. DV is released on Tuesday 26th of October as Spine 1022 in the US and we have it here in the UK from Monday 22nd of November. Well, that does it for October. And before I go, good news for UK Criterion fans. We have two long-awaited titles in November. As you can see behind me, Terence Malick's The Thin Red Line and Wes Anderson's Fantastic Mr Fox as well as new titles La Strada and there's 4K debuts from Citizen Kane, Uncut Gems, Menace to Society and Mulholland Drive, plus the box set of the complete films Once Upon a Time in China. So until next time, it's goodbye and don't forget, keep watching those great movies.